be reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort. Give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end. Her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the desert prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill should be made low. The rugged land shall be made a plain. The rough country a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Go up onto a high mountain, Zion, herald of glad tidings. Cry out at the top of your voice, Jerusalem, herald of good news. Fear not to cry out and say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Here comes with power the Lord God who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In the arms, he gathers the lambs, carrying them in his bosom and leading the ewes with care. Urbum Domini A reading from the second letter of St. Peter. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some regard delay, 
but he is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire, and the earth and everything done on it will be found out. Since everything is to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be, conducting yourselves in holiness and devotion, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved in flames and the elements melted by fire. But according to his promise, we await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you await these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him at peace. Verbum Domini. Deo gratias. shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Dominus vobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Gloria beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John the Baptist appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins people of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He fed on locusts and wild honey, and this is what he proclaimed. One mightier than I is coming after me, I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Verbum Domini. John the Baptist appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. Last Sunday, as the season of Advent began, we put our toe in the water to see if it was warm. 
And then during this past week, we've waded out into the water. But now it's time to get about doing the work of Advent. And that is to start swimming and conversion. Uh, we need to change. Uh, and that's what comes along uh, with this holy season. The Gospel writer, St. Mark, quoted a passage from Isaiah, uh, specifically chapter 40, verse 3, this announcement of uh, this prophet uh, saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And what he's doing uh, in the prophecy of Isaiah, which we heard in the first reading, and it's repeated uh, in the gospel, the prophet is announcing the return of the exiles from Babylon, and he depicts Yahweh as about to lead them through the desert back to Palestine. And the voice of a herald proclaims the coming of God so that a road may be prepared. And this imagery is given to us as derived from the custom of sending a herald to proclaim the forthcoming visit of a king so that the subjects might put badly kept roads into a proper state of repair. Now, we don't have roads that are in such disrepair as would have been at that time, uh, but we all know what a pothole is. We all know what a washboard is on a road. And whenever we drive through a pothole or around it, we think to ourselves, someone should prepare ye the way of the Lord. You know, <laughs> they need to get this nicely fixed for my coming. But we do this uh, in our times. Uh, when the Olympics is named for a particular city, that, whole, that city reinvents itself in many ways. Uh, they build stadiums and aquatic centers, but there's also a whole planning schematic that takes place where there's hotels that are built, there's restaurants that are added, and one of the things that is given attention is the flow of traffic. And so after the Olympics has come and gone, the city many times benefits from all of these infrastructure changes that have taken place uh, in the city. And it makes it easier for the residents that live there. When the president of the United States travels somewhere, what happens before he goes but a secret service detail is sent out ahead and they review the every step that this man is going to take for his security. Uh, but they go through and probably drive everybody crazy where the president is going to be. You need to change that. We need to fix this route. You know, everything needs to be adjusted uh, for the sake of this man or this woman uh, coming through, this dignitary coming through uh, to speak. But in our own daily lives, uh, or in a family life, I should say, <clears throat> what happens when a first baby, a firstborn, uh, is announced? You know, this happens every time a baby comes, but most, often, most especially when the first child comes. What do parents do? They suddenly transform their entire way of life. You know, they paint the house and put up wallpaper. Uh, furniture gets moved around. They buy a different car you know, in order to accommodate this new child. You know, if a child had any idea when he's this big what changes they have the power to make, thank God they're clueless when they're this little. You know, but parents make this radical change of life. And this is what happened when God came into our life as the firstborn of the redeemed. That our whole life, the whole earth, had to be uh, changed and made new by him. You know, but he affected this change. And so as he comes into our hearts, that's what he's asking of us, that this change uh, takes place in us. 
And so the words of the prophet Isaiah then are applied in the Gospel of St. Mark to John the Baptist. John is the herald who announces the coming of the Messiah, and he's urging the Jewish people to make due preparation to receive the Messiah. Uh, the baptism that John is giving was a rite which symbolized this interior renovation. So again, consider that word, renovation. It creates an inconvenience for us, but in the end, we all benefit from it. If you ever renovated something in your house, everything gets tipped upside down, and you say at a certain point, I can't wait until this is done. And then when it's done, we say, oh, isn't this nice? And we forget about the pain in the neck that it was during the course of the renovation. But most often, isn't this what we encounter interiorly? When there needs to be this renovation inside, the first thing we do is re we resist it. Because we say, do I really want to go through the inconvenience? Do I really want to bother with that? And sometimes we stay in that place for a good long time in our interior. I don't want to go through the inconvenience of this. And then we begin to undertake this change, this renovation. And yes, when that happens, our life interiorly, we feel a bit frustrated in here. We feel like inter interiorly, things are upside down. And then as they get put into place, as the Lord takes effect and rebuilds us interiorly, we see, well, this is be something that's beautiful. And we've made progress. You know, the signs that we see in the airport, you know, isn't it a nice thing? Pardon our progress. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right, you know, it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> I'll pardon you. You know, but this is what happens, you know, that again, we say, but this is so much better. The Lord has effected a, a great improvement in us. And so John is preaching the need for this interior renovation as a fitting preparation for the Messiah. And he does this by speaking of the need for penance uh, or repentance. And when he speaks and preaches to us and the church gives us his words at this time uh, in the Advent season, we're not to understand in that just a mere penitential exercises. This is where oftentimes Advent and Lent get compared to one another. Um, but this is not um, so much a season where we're uh, doing these penitential practices or exercises that are often, we often associate with the Lenten season. And yet, in this season of Advent, there is to be an experience of conversion and repentance. Um, and so, it's, uh, again, not just a regret for our sins of the past, but the word that John is using is metanoia, uh, the Greek word metanoia. And that means this, uh, this change of our mind and heart as we seek to come in conformity with God's will. So if you look up the word metanoia uh, on the computer, you're going to see that it speaks of a, a change in the way that one thinks or a transformative uh, change in the way that one thinks. And if there's a transformative change in the way we think, there's a transformative change in the way we behave or the way we act. Some make this reference that metanoia is this complete change of course. So it's not just a little tweaking. You know, we're heading this direction. And let's just make a couple degrees over here, you know. But it's really picking ourselves up. It's standing up and turning around and changing our course. That's what uh, John the Baptist is ultimately uh, challenging us to do. Now, 
many times when we think of the need for this metanoia, this change in our life, what do many people say? Um, people have regrets. But they'll say, I, I've really blown it in my life. I've really blown it. I've made a mess of it. Or we'll hear a phrase, if I had it to do all over again. Um, or another thing that we often say is that we believe in a God of second chances. We believe in a God of new beginnings. One of the fathers of the church uh, said that in response to this phrase, if I had it to do all over again, or I've really blown it in my life. To continue that phrase or that way of thinking, it's like, well, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? What would your life look like if you had that opportunity? Well, I would do this, or I would change that, or I would... If you've really blown it in your life and you had the opportunity to unblow what you've blown in your life, what would that look like? And I don't remember what Father of the Church said this, but he, he challenged, he said, well, now, don't worry about going back and trying to redo the wrong that's been done. But, you know, take the time that you have left, take the time right now, and begin to live that way today. And that's the opportunity that the Lord gives us, this God of second chances. Whatever it is that you've made a mess of, that's the change that we make. How would I live if I could do it right? That's what we begin to do right here, right now. And that's the invitation that we receive from God. Look at what we've heard in the scriptures today. Uh, we've, we've heard that the Lord takes our guilt away and that the Lord is patient with us and that he's very loving and tender with his people. In the first reading from the prophet Isaiah, heard this reference, comfort, give comfort to my people. Now remember, they've been in exile in Babylon. And here's the Lord bringing them back. So he says, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end and her guilt is expiated. So her service is at an end and her guilt is expiated. Isn't this what we all long to hear? And as we've preached many times, we have a difficult time accepting that. That the Lord in his ability to forgive us of our sins expiates the guilt, takes the guilt away. And we all want to be freed of that guilt. Allow him to do that this week. One of the greatest things you can do, many parishes are having a penance service this week or next week. Go. What do penance services usually do in parishes? The priest brings in all these guest priests. So you look at these priests, you say, never seen them in my life. Line up and go to the priest you've never seen in your life because you won't see him again, you know. Confess your sins and dig deep. You know, metanoia. Have this change, this new beginning. Um, the other thing that we hear is in that second reading from the second letter to St. Peter, the second letter of St. Peter, I'm sorry, he says, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some regard delayed, but he is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yet, then Peter adds, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So he's saying to us, God is so patient because he doesn't want any single one of us lost. And so he's waiting. You could imagine the Lord, you know, just sitting there, waiting and waiting and waiting, you know, even tapping his fingers on the table, like, 
get it together, you know. But I am coming, so don't take too long. You know, again, he's not looking to catch us up in our mistake. He's not looking to destroy us. But he reminds us, Peter reminds us, the Lord is coming. He's going to come like a thief. He's waiting for you to get it together. Um, this is the patience of someone who loves us. That's the God that we are in relationship with. And again, at the end of the first reading from the prophet Isaiah, that we get this image of the Lord as a shepherd. A shepherd, he fe as a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In his arms, he gathers the lamb, carrying them in his bosom and leading the ewes with care. So this tender, loving God uh, who's inviting us to this change in our life. And then finally, I just want to make a quick reference to this baptism that John is uh, giving out there in the wilderness. And we're told that people of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, the Jewish people were very familiar with ritual washings or symbolic uh, purifications and cleansings. St. John the Baptist himself was influenced by the Essene community, which resided outside of the city of Jerusalem. And it's believed that many uh, children who would have been orphaned uh, from the priestly class were taken in by the Essenes. And so what do we know about John the Baptist? His parents were quite elderly when he was born. And so as a young man, he probably found himself there among the Essenes. But not only the Essene community, but most of the Jewish uh, people had some form of ritual washings or these symb symbolic baths that they would uh, perform. But it was that what St. John the Baptist is making reference to in many ways is what would happen to a Gentile. So a Gentile, an unbeliever, hears this or is associating with the Jewish believer and wants to become part of this. And he wants to become a convert to the Jewish faith. And he needed, there's three things that were associated with that. One was circumcision. This is the mark of the covenant, uh, the covenant people. The second is that a sacrifice had to be made, a, a blood sacrifice uh, offered uh, for atonement. But then the third thing was that he had to undergo baptism, symbolizing a cleansing from all the pollution of his past life. So here's John the Baptist standing out there in the wilderness, and he's dressed in kind of a scary way, wearing camel hair. So he's not looking like some, um, it's not appealing, put it that way and it's not posh. So he's getting their attention because he's dressed like a prophet because that's what he is, he's a prophet. And so they recognize there's this voice of prophecy that's being uh, activated uh, or resurging among the people that they haven't heard for ages. And then he, what he's eating is this locust or these, it, it either is a real locust or this little bean or, and this honey. And this is the food of the poor. And so the food of the poorest of the poor. When we hear the gospel preached to us, what convicts us? Is the guy or the, the gal preaching the gospel saying one thing and living another? Or are they really living what they're preaching. They're practicing what they preach. And John the Baptist was doing that wholeheartedly. And so this is what was attracting them to him. Because this guy is really living this life that he's preaching to us, this life of repentance. And so they're attracted to his word and to his example. And what he's saying to them ultimately is that um, a Jew, these Jewish people were being invited to submit to that very thing that uh, Gentiles were supposed to do when they converted. Uh, 
uh, when they change their way of life. And so he's telling them that um, to be a Jew in the racial sense was not necessarily, it didn't mean that you were automatically a member of God's chosen people. Um, a Jew might be in exactly the same place as a Gentile. And so in order to uh, belong to God, a Gentile and a Jew needed to change. Isn't this what Jesus ultimately came along after John and was teaching that self-same thing? And so this is the invitation for all of us, that in this season of Advent we recognize, you know what, hey, I I'm not so perfect. I may have this in my head, you know, certainly I'm, you know, just a wonderful person. You know, but this humbling that takes place, that I'm a Gentile, I'm this, this person who is unclean, and I need to be made clean. And so there's this need for humility, and we can imitate the humility of John the Baptist who said, I'm not worthy to do the work of a slave. I'm not worthy to bend down and remove the sandals of the one who's coming, the Messiah who's coming. And when we prepare for this baptism, this change that John the Baptist is talking about, uh, there's three things that, that we confront in this conversion. And it's very much like the 12 steps. Anybody who's familiar with the 12 steps of AA, uh, among those things is that we have to confront ourselves, we have to make amends with our neighbor, and we have to entrust ourselves to a higher power, to God. And isn't this what we do when we recognize we need to have this conversion in our life? First, we're forced to face ourselves. That's probably the most difficult thing ever because our pride gets in the way. We have to say, I am an alcoholic. I am an addict in one way or another. And so what we have to say to ourselves is, I am a sinner. And we identify that area of sin in our life that needs to be changed. Then we go to our neighbor and make amends. I've sinned against you. I need your forgiveness. This demands humility. I think many of us have been in a situation where people come to us and say, now, you know, if there's anything I've ever done that's, uh, that's offended you, if there's anything I've ever done that you've taken offense by, that's not asking forgiveness from our neighbor. We don't go to our neighbor and say, you tell me what I, how you've been offended by me. No, you have to be aware yourself of how I've offended. I have to be aware in myself of how I've offended you. The burden is on me, not on you. And I need to ask you from my heart to forgive me for what I've done against you. Again, this is this radical change in our life. And dare I say, the easiest person to go to to ask forgiveness from is God. You know, it's difficult to confront ourselves, then to go to our neighbor, and then to go to God and say, forgive me, for I am a sinner. And knowing how gentle and merciful he is. And this promise then of John the Baptist that the one who's to come after him is going to give this powerful outpouring of the gift of his Holy Spirit. And this reference to the baptism with the Holy Spirit signifies the outpouring of the gifts of the Spirit, not only in the sacrament of baptism, but in the entire economy of salvation that would be established by Jesus Christ. The prophets foretold, many of the prophets uh, spoke of this copious effusion of the Holy Spirit as a characteristic of the Messianic age. And this is what the prophet John the Baptist is doing. It's speaking of this baptism of the Spirit. 
that there would be this, remember this throughout this week, the copious effusion of the gift of the Spirit. You know, this is going to be, as we experience this conversion, we're going to be filled with this life and this gift of the Spirit that affects this union with Jesus Christ and with his Father.